All right, so I think let's get started. Um, so whoever has joined, welcome. As I said earlier, please use this question option during the presentation if you have any questions on an ongoing basis and I'll try to answer them as we go along and uh, you will have a chance to ask questions through the uh, meeting software itself uh, at the very end. So welcome to our webinar session about how to use Spark to detect stolen AWS credentials. Um, this will be about an hour long presentation um, and let's get, let's get going. Um, so first of all, let me introduce ourselves. The company that I work for is called Open Credo. Uh, we are a small uh, London-based consulting company uh, and we focus on um, doing consultancy with leveraging emerging technologies or cutting edge technologies, uh, which at the moment means we are very engaged in the cloud space. We are doing a lot of DevOps and infrastructure automation. Uh, and as well as distributed systems uh, such as microservice architectures and big data, uh, distributed data processing technologies. Uh, and here's a list of our technology partners, which pretty much covers the same area. So as you can see, there is a lot of infrastructure related uh, partnership there with Amazon and Google Cloud, as well as um, distributed data technologies, Cassandra, Hazel, Cast, or, or Couchbase. Or, or Neo4j graph database. On the right hand side, you can see our website and our Twitter handle. Do visit us, do follow us, and uh, ask any questions that you have uh, with, about Open Credo. A little bit um, about myself. Uh, my name is David Borsos. I've been working with Open Credo for three plus years now, and my focus is really the distributed system space, whether it's uh, distributed data technologies or, or microservice architecture, that's my main area, and hence uh, my involvement with the, the Spark, uh, um, Spark related work. And on the right hand side, you can see my Twitter handler, and that's my page on the Open Credo blog, where you can see my blog posts. So our motivation to do this uh, webinar and to do this work is, is really coming from two different directions. First of all, we wanted to take a look into Spark Structure Streaming API, which is a, a new API in Spark. In fact, it's so new, it's still in, in alpha phase. Uh, we have uh, experience with Spark, but we mainly used it for the batching, uh, for the batch processing, and we wanted to look at what it can do in a streaming case. Uh, and the other side of it is that cloud security is an increasingly important topic. Uh, you probably heard about the uh, hacks that happened over the weekend across the world. Um, so IT security is something that actually people can feel more and more and it's there is a, a lot more emphasis on it and when you move your infrastructure to the cloud it actually becomes even more difficult to to do security right and this is a, a, a nice real scenario which means we have a real problem and a real use case with a real event stream that is supplied by amazon cloudwatch um, which uh, gives us a, a very realistic case to evaluate Spark. Uh, also, there is a lot of complexity in the actual events that we that we get. Uh, there is a lot of variety in the events. However, the event stream itself is, itself is very accessible. It's, it's very easy to set up and tap into this event stream. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is mostly a proof of concept, uh, exploring what's possible in this space and, and not the end of the journey. It's not a final solution. It's rather just a, uh, let's see what we, what we can do with these tools and let's explore the space. So the agenda is going to be, I, I'm going to talk about what the problem is and what are the consequences of, of this problem. Then we'll look into a little bit uh, from the higher level, what stream processing is and, and what's, why it's good for you. Um, then dive into the details of our solution. I will show you a quick demo and then we'll wrap up and open for questions. So let's start with the problem um, and what the consequences are. So as 
developers and as organizations leverage the cloud, uh, even developers increasingly often need to interact with uh, with the cloud infrastructure and need to create potentially this cloud infrastructure. Um, and the various automation tools also uh, help in that. So tools like Terraform uh, require developers. They, they give a lot of power to developers and they require for much more people to have access uh, to the cloud infrastructure at an administrator level. Um, and often by accident, it's very easy to, to compromise or it can be quite easy to compromise these credentials that allow you access to your cloud infrastructure. Mm. So accidentally, these uh, access keys can end up in public GitHub repositories by somebody making a mistake and, and making an accidental commit. The Git ignores not covering uh, everything correctly. Uh, sometimes people hard code these keys in their code and, and sometimes uh, people don't have a sufficient separation of privileges. So, so they have a single AWS key pair that, that is very powerful and can do a lot of, um, a lot of potential damage. Um, and then the bad guys, the hackers, scan GitHub and look for these credentials and say, hey, there is a bunch of AWS access key secret keys. Let's mine some Bitcoin and spend your money mining, mining Bitcoin for ourselves. So what they do is they take your access credentials and they create a bunch of uh, very large instances in regions that you not don't normally use, uh, which is very, very easy from, to automate from their perspective. They literally just scan the scan GitHub and if they match on an access key, they just create instances. This can be scripted in a, in a very, very short amount of code. And additionally, they don't actually need to explore your infrastructure in detail. They just get the access keys. They don't need to know what you're doing, uh, which would uh, which would be required if they wanted to actually cause you some uh, more direct damage. However, this will cost you a lot of money uh, very fast. Anybody who is using AWS can tell that it's very, very easy to rack up a lot of uh, infrastructure costs from seemingly innocent uh, um, pieces. Uh, it, it can actually go up quite quickly. And you... It's very difficult to detect, uh, especially difficult to detect it quickly because you need to notice these rogue instances, but the chances are that they will be appearing in regions that you don't normally use, or you need to take a look at your uh, AWS bill, which you probably don't do on a daily basis. And most importantly, uh, whatever happens, um, it's not going to impact the liveness or liveness of your existing infrastructure. So your services, your primary business is going to function as it was before. You're just going to be running a bunch of other machines that you don't necessarily even see, uh, but they will cost you money. The Amazon itself gives you some support around this. You can set up thresholds on, on a billing uh, and, and when your bills exceed a certain threshold, uh, you get a, a, an email notification. Uh, you can set up CloudWatch alerts um, to a certain extent to try to detect these, um, this type of activity. And actually, AWS support can proactively contact you if they think that there is something dodgy going on. Additionally, you yourself in the infrastructure administrator space can do a lot of things um, to try to mitigate the risk. Uh, you can limit the the power of the various various users that you that they have access to your AWS infrastructure. You can rotate your credentials frequently, activate or deactivate credentials, deactivate credentials when you don't need them, and only activate them when you do need them. Have Git hooks to check whether anybody is submitting anything that they shouldn't have or anybody is pushing anything to a master Git repository that shouldn't happen. And most importantly, monitor the activity, monitor, understand what's going on in your cloud infrastructure. And that is what we are going to focus on today. Um, we want to be able to detect anomalies early, and that's a, actually a quite important thing. And it's not only applicable for uh, for the cases when somebody is hacking you, but but you can even pick up uh, mistakes or or code bugs uh, if you have monitoring sufficient amount of monitoring of the infrastructure in place. 
So to turn this into a bit more formal set of requirements, uh, we can say that as an infrastructure administrator, when something unusual happens, then I want to get notified in real time. And to pick this apart a little bit more in detail, as an infrastructure admin is basically the people responsible for running the AWS infrastructure. When something unusual happens now, here we'll have to do, spend some time in discussing what's unusual. And to understand what is unusual, first we have to understand your usual operational patterns that apply to your organization. In our own experience, we typically uh, notice that organizations tend to operate uh, with in, in certain patterns. They tend to use specific regions where their business is located. So, for example, uh, let's suppose you have a, a London-based business, you have a you are using Amazon region in Ireland on, or in London, so EU West one or two, as well as you have a, a branch in the US, so you have a, a, a the US East region, but but you really wouldn't use anything in Asia, for example. Same thing applies to instance types. Typically, you would pick certain types of instances that fit your use cases well, like uh, a lot of people wouldn't necessarily use um, Instances in AWS that um, that have that has um, uh, GPU uh, dedicated GPUs because you don't normally need dedicated GPUs, or the reverse can be true that your business actually requires a lot of computing and you want GPU instances, but you don't care about the high, high memory. Um, instances or the SSD instances. So you pick a couple of series, you pick a couple of instance sizes, and they usually tend to stick to those. Also, you kind of understand your typical usage patterns. You know when you are going to create machines and you you don't create instances in the middle of the night. Um, and you typically won't be, won't be generating or won't be creating a lot of machines at the same time. And most organizations that we work with end up coming up with some sort of tagging patterns that they apply to any resource in AWS. So that was the usual usage pattern. So anything unusual is whatever falls out of this pattern. So regions that you don't normally operate in, uh, for example, we open credo don't really uh, launch any infrastructure in in the Tokyo area. That's AP Northeast one. We you don't tend to use very large instances uh, or very specialized instances. You tend you want if if something does doesn't carry the the commonly established tagging pattern that that is a red flag that you want to want to definitely note notice about even if it's not um, not a hacking attempt. You 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 are interested in anything unusual happening in your infrastructure. Too many instances at the same time or, or spending too much money in a, in a short period of time, racking up your hourly cost too much in a short period of time. And it's definitely things that you want to know about. And, uh, and another example can be that you create machines with too short of lifespan. So you just bring something up and then you destroy it within a couple of minutes. That's potentially something that is uh, suspicious. Um, so, so far I've, I've been focusing on EC2 and talking about compute instances. Um, this is because uh, this exercise and this webinar is deliberately limited in scope. We wanted to explore the possibilities and, and we wanted to focus on a couple of cases, a couple of use cases, and, and we picked EC2 uh, because this is the biggest direct financial risk there is a lot of non-financial risk uh, uh, that is associated with losing your Amazon credentials. So, for example, uh, stealing the da your data or, or losing your data is obviously very important. Um, and you should have in-depth defenses against that, but it's much harder for the attacker to do that while generating uh, compute instances is very easy to do. And it's a straightforward attack vector that we that we understand very well. Um, therefore, it was easy, uh, relatively easy to, to build up uh, tools to, to detect it. So going back to the requirements, uh, when the unusual things happens, then we want to get notified in real time. Uh, we picked to send alert messages on Slack. 
um, which is our tool of choice for uh, team communication, and it's a good tool to do this sort of notifications as well. Now, let's think a little bit about real time. Uh, what does it mean in this context? Um, I would translate it to, to as soon as possible, um, which is again, there is no, not necessarily a, a hard time limit on when this uh, can happen, but it's typically we would aim to having latency in the in the seconds at maximum up in the minutes range. We want to be reacting on events and we want to send push style notifications to Slack. So the reacting is is very important. This is not a bash processing that we pick up sometime later overnight. This is happening as soon as uh, as we actually detect that something is wrong and that's a fully event driven um, um, reactive system. So there is a stream of events coming out of CloudWatch and um, and this is where we do our processing. And because it's a stream of events, therefore a stream processing framework uh, was an appropriate choice to deal with it. So a little bit about the stream processing itself. Uh, in general, stream processing operates on an incoming stream of events, and again, it gives you real-time processing, which is the main point of it is it is reactive processing. It's not a scheduled uh, process that that loads up a scheduled batch, but uh, as as the events come in from this event stream, you react on them immediately, and you will have processing latency in somewhere in the seconds uh, range of seconds. Now you can handle individual events or you can um, and you can react on individual events or you can try to analyze the combination of multiple events and that's the area of stream analytics and and it's uh, multi combination of multiple events can give you a, a, a lot of additional value that that you don't get out of individual ones now we picked to use a framework to do this stream analytics, um, which is strictly speaking not necessary. You can just write some custom code that ingests these events and, and runs the custom code to react on them. But a, a framework gives you a, a number of um, a number of benefits. Uh, first of all, you get uh, more advanced analytical tools out of the box, so you can do time windowing and aggregation uh, out of the box, and, and implementing these in a distributed environment is not necessarily trivial. The second is that it, you get some structure of the code is given by you by the framework, uh, so you have to you can only focus on your business logic. You don't have to worry about the dealing with the technicalities of consuming the events. Um, there might be some restrictions because of this, but uh, but the benefits of overall outweigh. Um, and you get uh, most frameworks give you the uh, distributed processing semantics, a deployment model, and very importantly, fault tolerance. So ideally, you would want to process every single event exactly once. And this is, again, in a distributed system when anything can fail. It's not necessarily trivial to achieve, but the tools uh, like Spark streaming or Spark structure streaming can help you a lot uh, in achieving uh, exactly one semantics. So after this overview of what our problem is and, uh, and stream processing, uh, let's dive into our actual solution. So on a very high level, um, this is a, a general uh, conceptual diagram of pretty much any stream processing system. You will have a source of events that will just continuously emit these events as things happen in, in the real world, which you, you then somehow ingest this stream of events into your stream processing tool, uh, which contains both the stream processing framework and your processing code. Um, you do your analytics, you do your reactions, and then, then finally you consume these events somewhere. Um, so in our case, uh, these are the technologies that uh, were picked to do this. Uh, so our source of events is obviously uh, CloudWatch that was um, um, given, and we use Kinesis for our ingestion to get the events into Apache Spark structure streaming, and then finally to reach Slack. Diving into the details of these, so CloudWatch. Um, 
is a, an Amazon AWS feature that basically generates events when any AWS uh, infrastructure APIs are used. And you can set up rules of matching these events and you can tell CloudWatch that if something happens, I want to capture all these events coming out, all these things that are happening in our in my AWS infrastructure, and I want you to drop it into Kinesis in our case. Now the actual events themselves, um, they are of JSON format and they capture um, API interactions with AWS, so HTTP request response pairs. They have a, a uniform wrapping around them, so every single event will have some common data that contains user information, timestamps, uh, the type of the event very importantly, and and uh, blocks for the HTTP request and response, which is greatly uh, varies uh, depending on the types of the events. So the details of each of them are significantly different. You will have very different details when you are running instances versus when you are creating tags or updating the security groups. Interestingly, these events of, often apply to multiple resources at the same time. So this structure that you can see on the screen when you have a set of instances which contains an items that is an array of uh, several instances is very, very common and it appears across most of the, most of the events that I saw. Um, there is an example put on the, that I just put on the screen about a single create instance event. So, so this whole thing describes all the information that is available as a, in a CloudWatch event uh, when you launch a single instance in Amazon. I don't expect anybody to uh, read that. I just wanted to put it up to appreciate the 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 amount of information that you actually can pull out from these events. Zooming in a little bit, every single uh, CloudWatch event contains uh, some common information, like the user details. Most importantly, what we are interested in from the user details is the user's name and the access key ID that was used to do this particular operation, as well as the name of the event, which will be used to branch the code and, and to parse the various details appropriately and uh, the region where this particular event was originated from. Um, in a instance, uh, run instances case, this is how a request would look like. So the request actually is not uh, not very interesting for us. You basically say, uh, AWS, I want uh, uh, several of instances of this AMI of this instance type and, and go and create them. But in the actual response, you get the same information and more. Uh, most importantly, you get the instance ID and the instance type back, which is what we are actually interested about in our particular case. So that's why that those are the info that is the piece of information that we are going to capture. Now, once these events are generated in CloudWatch, they are put into Kinesis. That is a standard AWS feature. We don't really need to have to do anything else but configure it, and it's uh, quite easy to configure that. Kinesis um, is function in our architecture is to buffer this event stream, to, to put a layer of abstraction between our processing code and the source of the events, because in our in our Spark code, we don't really necessarily want to connect to every single different type of event source. We want like a common interface uh, such as Kinesis to to talk to, and also the um, Kinesis acts as a buffer uh, because it is possible that uh, that our produce, producer and consumer moves at different speeds, and if we can buffer up the the data in the middle, that allows us allows them to actually move at different speeds. Um, and finally, Kinesis is a technology that allows multiple different consumers uh, consuming the same uh, set of data. It is Amazon's hosted stream broker. Uh, it's very similar to Apache Kafka, uh, but it's fully managed by Amazon and it's not API compatible with it. Um, but conceptually, it offers similar things. It has a partitioned uh, event stream they call the partition shards, uh, which also means that you lose the ability to have a global ordering on events. You are going to um, get everything, but but there will be no order and, and you might be inserting 
uh, items onto Kinesis Stream in different order uh, uh, than you're reading it. It's a highly available store. Amazon gives this semantics to you, um, and it's kind of semi-persistent. I put this uh, phrase up there because um, there is some retention of data there, but it's time-based. Um, so by default, data is retained up to 24 hours, and you can extend this to seven days, but it has an additional cost. Uh, but it's not a database. You basically can just start reading at some point uh, in the past 24 hours, and you have to just go through and read sequentially everything uh, out of Kinesis. Um, as I said before, it is very much a, not a queue semantic uh, uh, infrastructure. It has topic semantics. Reading is non-destructive on Kinesis data, and you can have multiple producers or consumers. It, uh, in a single single Kinesis um, stream, it will be just broadcasted to every consumer. Um, and most importantly, the consumer need to maintain the read state. So the server, the Kinesis broker, is not going to remember your consumer if you want to uh, resume um, scrolling through the stream. At some point, you will have to deal with that on the client side. Next is our stream processor, Apache Spark. Um, and we are going to take a deep dive into what this is. The main purpose of the stream processor is the main responsibilities is to parse these events, which are still in JSON format in Kinesis, to filter out the relevant messages, execute our custom rules, and generate the alerts, which will be subsequently sent to Slack. So Spark Structure Streaming, I'm quoting from the documentation here, provides a fast, scalable, fault tolerant end-to-end, exactly once stream processing without the user having to reason about streaming. So fast and scalable, that has been always been a selling point of, of Spark. Um, originally, Spark started off as a batching framework, and it was much faster than Hadoop, and, and by the default, it was designed to be a distributed system and it was designed with scaling and fault tolerance in mind and structure streaming inherited these properties. Now, interesting um, here is that Spark structure streaming uh, gives you exactly one stream processing semantics, which is actually quite hard to achieve and they do a lot of work in the background to make that happen. Um, and very importantly, it, it hides away the streaming nature uh, of the data set actually quite well. So when you are writing your, your uh, data processing logic, you don't have to think about, is this a stream now? Is this not a stream now? You just have the abstract idea of how your data looks like and you write your processing code and Spark deals with the um, actual how to, how to process the data in a stream. So, as I said, Spark itself is a distributed data processing uh, framework. It was it started off as a batch processing uh, tool in Twitter, then it got open source, and uh, and the Apache uh, Foundation took it over, and they kept adding more and more functionality to it, um, uh, including the streaming um, APIs. It has very, very high level functional APIs and many different ways of interacting with it. You can use Scala, SQL, R, or Python to access these APIs, actually Java too. But the framework itself, Spark itself, is written in, uh, in Scala. And the good thing about Spark is you really deal with the data itself and the data structures, and the implementation is, is hidden away from you, and you, you can write really abstract high level code. Now, I picked Scala for my uh, preferred way of interacting with it, with, with Spark, uh, because from past experience, actually Scala always gives you access to all the features, uh, because Spark itself is written in Scala, any new functionality will be available in Scala first. The other reason is that I'm a, a Java developer by background, and I'm reasonably comfortable with using any other JVM languages. Um, so I'm going to show you some code examples later on, and they will all be in Scala, but they are hopefully quite easy to understand. 
Now, Structured Streaming is a new API in Spark. It's so new that it's still actually considered to be in alpha state, and it's very importantly not the same as Spark Streaming. Spark Streaming operates over an abstraction called uh, DStreams, which is uh, pretty much an extension of Spark original um, RDD API. RDD stands for Resilient Distributed Dataset. Um, and these stream deals with micro batches of these RDDs. Um, uh, structure streaming, on the other hand, is based on Spark's data frame API, which was introduced in Spark 1.6. And it was more geared towards SQL type of processing operating over um, tabular data structures. Um, it's conceptually similar to RDDs in many ways that the data sets are considered to be replicated and resilient and, and distributed in nature. But uh, data frames are very much tabular. They have rows, uh, and each row has columns, and these columns have the data. Uh, while previously, only in the RDD or dataset API, you, you can pretty much have an arbitrary data structure um, under processing. Now, in a lot of problems, this is actually not a problem, and the, and the tabular data structure is more than welcome because it's much easier to reason about it. Now, interestingly, the Structured Streaming API introduces a layer of unification above the batch and stream processing. Um, so you could use data, you were able to use data frames uh, for batch processing for quite uh, quite some time now since Spark 1.6. Um, but the stream API and the batch processing API was always distinct. They looked similar, but there was no actual code relation between the two. Now that has changed. And with structured streaming, you can actually literally use the same code, uh, same data analysis code to do stream analysis or to do batch analysis. Um, and as I said, it's still in alpha state, but because of the data frame batch API has been around for quite a while, uh, it's actually quite mature and, and it, it doesn't feel like an alpha API at all. So to parse the events, uh, we, we have the incoming big JSON structure uh, and we filter the event names and the successful calls and we do some basic parsing using JSON paths uh, because that was a, a good tool to, to find the information that was relevant for us. Now I'd like to emphasize that we only include successful calls uh, for now. Uh, again, this was due to a, a deliberately limiting our own scope so that we had a, a, a limited time time frame to deliver anything and we wanted to keep the scope limited. Um, and while failures uh, are reported by CloudWatch and they can be very interesting security wise, you can see if somebody is trying to probe your APIs from the failed calls as well, somebody is exploring what is possible, what is not, uh, we, we include, exclude this for now. Um, so as I said, every CloudWatch event can refer to many different resources. So we flatten these collections out and we typically pick either the request or the response side of the event because only one of them, well, one of them usually contains all the information that we are actually interested in. So for example, the, in the run instances case, we, we use the response because that contains the instance ID plus all the useful information while in a create tags event, the response actually just says, okay, I have created the tags, but the, the request create, contains all the resource identifiers and all the, the tag requests that you want to do. Um, and we drop any information that we are not interested in, so we keep the user data, times, instance IDs, uh, 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 and so on, but we drop quite a lot coming out of that event. And we kind of create a flat, table-like data structure. Um, so there is an example code for a reading a single event. So as you can see, we parse out a couple of details using a JSON path. But I'd like to emphasize this class of user identity. Now that user identity is actually a complex data structure. So while uh, structure streaming and data frames uh, prefer like tables, but the columns of those tables can be more complex data types. There is still a lot of limitations there, but you can have nested structures in structure streaming. Um, 
So after we parse the uh, the events and we, we read, read up the data that we are interested in, we carry on processing them. And the first thing that happens is is we augment the event data, especially in the run instances case, we, we augment the event data with, uh, with some information that we statically create. Um, uh, in this case, we want to Want to, want to be able to see what is the hourly cost of these newly created instances. Um, and, um, and this is stored in a CSV file uh, uh, separately in S3, and we join this data with our incoming event stream. Uh, after we've done that, uh, we are executing the rules for uh, the individual events and, and we do the time windowing. We aggregate up uh, how many instances you have created in the past two minutes, how many, how is the total hourly cost of these instances in the past two minutes. And we do this for on a per user basis. So every single user get this aggregation up and on a, or when they apply the same type of aggregation on the full account. So to visualize this, for individual events, uh, this is the augmentation um, on, a, on a diagram. So on the top left corner, we have the incoming parsed event stream, parsed and filtered event stream, uh, in this case, running instances. And we have our two developers, Alex and Chris, creating instances. Um, then on the bottom left of the corner, uh, we have the uh, the CSV data that we statically put on S3 and we join the two data sets together. So this results in, every, for every single incoming uh, run instances event, it results in exactly once one outgoing event, which outgoing event is going to be augmented with the data from the CSV file. So for example, there is that Alex creating a C4 large in EU West 1 that results in a, an augmented event. Alex creating a C4 large instance in EU West 1, which doesn't raise any immediate alerts and this costs us uh, $0.113 an hour. Afterwards, we apply the rules to these to this outgoing stream of uh, data, and these rules can pick up any particular warnings that we again statically define. If this size of instance is being created, this is a warning or this is a severe problem that we want to flag. So we identify those cases which are, are problematic from some sense based on our rules, and then we generate the alerts from these. <clears throat> So in code, this actually looks very simple. So whatever is on the screen now is basically doing the, reading the CSV, reading the events from the stream and evaluating the rules. Uh, so to walk through it step by step, there is the definition of the this augmentation data, the CSV data is reading, being read up from, uh, from S3. While we read the event stream from uh, Kinesis and we filter only the run instances events and only those that uh, don't have any, that were successful. And then we execute this join between the two, and and it's very very readable. This code is very readable, and it's very simple actually to to join two datasets that are different in nature. One of them is a batch type of dataset, the other is a stream, and and we can still join them very simply. And notice that we are actually referring back to that other variable that we defined that represents the. Uh, the CSV on S3. Now, importantly, Spark doesn't actually read up all this data into memory when you did the, do this type of operations. It just kind of creates your pointer objects that point to the various sets of data or to, that represent these sets of data in an abstract manner. Then when we have the augmented event stream, we, we channel it through our rule set, which is just a, a collection of very simple Scala objects that evaluate the event data. So each of these rules get a, get an event which is of the type row and you can get uh, the various columns out of this uh, event then you execute the rules and create alerts. So interestingly, the, the processing here, the rule processing itself refers to various pieces of uh, data. So this alert level is coming from the, the CSV side of the join, while the instance type is actually on the stream. So we have access at this point, that row represents the joined up uh, data structure. So the next stop is the time windowing, and I'm going to show you some 
code and examples of how the time windows looks like. Um, so again, we have a incoming event stream, which is in this case uh, is already passed this augmentation phase, and we already parsed it and filtered on uh, the run instances. Um, and I added the uh, timestamp information to this as well. Now what we do is uh, we define a time window that covers all the events that happen between 8.56 and 8.58 a.m. And we select all the events from the stream that fall into this time window and we sum up the number of instances and the total cost per user, total hourly cost per user introduced by adding these instances. So the original four events that we had in this particular time window results in two outgoing events. So in this case, we actually decreased the number of data points in our stream. Um, and this results in, okay, in this time window, Alex has created three instances for a little bit over $2 an hour <clears throat> cost, while Chris has created only a single one, but that was much more expensive. Then we roll this time window forward a minute uh, and we apply the same uh, aggregation again and once more again. So we'll have a number of events that uh, that actually aggregate up all the incoming run instances events within these two minute time windows. Now, after applying this, we have a another data stream, uh, uh, which is actually different to the first one. Uh, it has less items, it has items that are aggregations of the original AWS um, emitted events. And we take this stream of data and we apply our rules on top of this stream of data. And these rules are going to be like, okay, how many instances this user have created in the in this two minute windows and how much did they spend on these instances or how much will this increase our total hourly cost. And um, see there between 8.57 and 8.59, uh, our user Chris has uh, created some instances which uh, increased our hourly cost by $32 an hour, which is something that we probably want to flag. Uh, that's actually quite a lot if you think about it, that's more than $500 uh, per day. So probably something of a worry. And again, the, the code itself is, is quite simple to do it. Um, so we start off reading from Kinesis and, and processing, parsing the events. And then we apply this windowing rule and that's that three lines of code there basically. So we group by, uh, group the events by a time window and by the user ID, and then we aggregate the hourly cost as a, as our total cost. There is one additional line of code there, this with watermark. Because this is a, a not a strictly ordered system, we want to allow late events to arrive. So if some event arrives out of order, then we still want to include it into this time window. And that with watermark will make, will tell Spark that, okay, we want to wait a little bit uh, before uh, you close this time window. And then again, we apply the rule uh, rules on this outgoing uh, stream. Um, and the rules are very similar to the previous case, but now they operate on these aggregates. So we can ask, ask information like this total cost, which is the result of, uh, of this summing operation per time window. And then if the total cost is higher than a certain threshold, we raise an alert. So the final piece in our architecture is, uh, is Slack. Uh, Slack's functionality is just basically to, dis to receive and display the alert summary for the operators. The good thing about using Slack for this is that you can get it on your mobile very easily. You can get it on your PC. So it's by nature multi-device and you, you actually can configure your mobile so that it uh, it proactively notifies you. It, it, it rings your mobile if, uh, if there is an incoming uh, communication incoming alert. So we didn't have to invent an alerting system. We can just piggyback Slack. Um, so the alerting itself is actually done mostly in, uh, in our Spark code. Uh, there is this for each writer interface, which sits at the very end of the processing chain. And it's an interface that you supply a custom integration for, uh, and basically it gets invoked for every single item in a data stream. 
then we simply use Slack's incoming webhooks plugins, which gives, which basically once set up, you get a URL in Slack where, against which you just execute a HTTP post and it generates a message off of that HTTP post in the appropriate channel. And there is this JSLack library that, uh, that I've been using, which made it actually very easy to, to put this Slack integration together. Um, Conceptually, it's, it's simple at this point. We have a stream of alerts. At this point, there is no other data on the stream. It's only a bunch of alerts, which we channel into Slack reporter, which then turns these alerts into HTTP requests that are sent to Slack. Um, Code-wise, again, Putting it into Spark is trivial. You just say, okay, at this point, I finished processing my stream. I want to consume it. I want to write it somewhere. So you say write stream and you define where do you want to write it. In our case, it's going to go to Slack. And the Slack reporter, which is this implementation of a for each writer is, is very easy. Basically, you have to imp override the uh, three methods, open, close, and process. But uh, open and close, in our case, don't do anything. And process gets invoked for every single uh, alert item on the data stream. We just assemble this payload and invoke the um, Slack API with a HTTP post, <clears throat> and and that's it. And this is how it looks like in Slack. So there is a, a, an example event uh, or a set of example alerts in Slack, uh, which uh, raises notifications because two large instances were created. And here is another one which raises notifications for uh, a time window alert. So too many instances for too high hourly costs were created in that particular time window. <clears throat> so at this point, there is a short demo that I wanted to do. Now this demo shows me um, creating, a, launching an instance manually in AWS and then seeing the alerts uh, from that that are triggered because of launching that instance in Slack. Um, I didn't want to do a live demo because it's uh, because I can talk much more easily through it when uh, when it's pre-recorded. So here is the video. Um, so as you can see on the left side, there is an AWS console where I go and manually launch a, a instance. I will choose a T2 large for my instance size, and I'm going to skip for most of the screens there are like four or five screens that you have to do but they are not actually that interesting so let's just launch the instance immediately and as you can see in the list of uh, instances in my AWS console now there is the newly launched instance and I'm going to give it a name um, so there we go that has now been launched now what is happening in the background at the moment is that AWS CloudWatch is generating two distinct events on uh, on our incoming uh, stream. One event for creating the instance itself, and the other is when I name the instance that actually turns into a create tags event. So the name in AWS is just a, a specific tag or a, or a special tag. These events eventually make their way into our, through Kinesis into our processing code, uh, which then should result in uh, some messages alerting in Slack. Uh, so I pick the T2 instance size, uh, T2 large instance, and I set the alerting rules deliberately to be fairly aggressive. Reason being, I didn't actually want to spend too much money on uh, on testing this. I wanted to go with cheap instance types, but obviously this is configurable. So the alerts appeared in screen and the specific instance ID is included in the messages and I'm just filtering on them in the Amazon console. And as you can see, it's the newly created DeviBot test demo one instance so so that was a, a quick demo this is how it actually works when you put everything together so a couple of uh, challenging bits in the implementation side and just generally about the uh, doing this uh, exploratory exercise. Uh, so first of all, the data frame API itself, I, I really like this data frame APIs, but it does prefer a relatively simple data structure. This is a sparse data frame API. Um, most importantly, you cannot use any type inheritance uh, in, in data objects sitting on the data frame stream. You can do nested structures, um, 
spot. It has to be very static. You, you can't use object-oriented polymorphism. So that actually resulted in me sometimes leaving parts of the data in JSON and only only deserializing the JSON when um, when I already knew exactly what I'm going to get out of it. Also, everything must be serializable in Spark. That includes some your processing code as well. When you are doing Scala, lambdas, or very simple objects, that's not a problem. But if you have any external resource dependency, then you have to be prepared to initialize them in a lazy way, and you have to be um, be sure that Scala is not going to try to serialize those objects on the wire. This will interestingly work in your local machine, but once you deploy into a distributed environment, it just uh, starts throwing you very uh, serialization errors. So a transient lazy private well is your friend, basically, that structure. The other thing is that the single event rules and the time windowing, uh, they I tried to combine the two and, and just get a single alert stream out of it, but that was just not possible. So you have to actually maintain multiple streams of data and multiple processing chains. And that actually results in reading uh, multiple, um, multiple, maintaining multiple readers on Kinesis, but that's okay because Kinesis does support uh, multiple consumers, so that's not really a problem. It's something that's good to be aware of. Kinesis itself is um, was a bit of a challenge. It was very obvious choice to get the uh, the event data out of Amazon. Kinesis is really good in that. There is built-in integration with CloudWatch and all that, but um, Spark structured streaming doesn't have a connector with Kinesis at the moment because Spark structure streaming is different to Spark streaming. Uh, Spark streaming does have a Kinesis con connector, structure streaming doesn't have. At the moment, it's very early stages in this API, so they can only offer connectivity to Kafka, TCP sockets, and, and some files. Um, so I ended up implementing a very, very simplistic connector that can at least read from Kinesis. It has some serious limitations. It's not highly available, and it's only for functional testing. Uh, on the other hand, to achieve that point is relatively easy. It took me about two days with including learning everything that I needed to learn about these technologies, plus uh, writing the code. It took about two days to, to do it. So it actually wasn't that difficult. Uh, but, but that's, a, that's a definite limitation at the moment. And last but not least, uh, probably the, the most annoying uh, problem that I ran into uh, with this implementation was accessing files on S3. So that CSV file with the additional instance data, the, the hourly cost and that information, um, I put the CSV file in S3, and I wanted to use AWS instance profiles to access the information. Now, unfortunately, um, while Spark is separate from Hadoop, it actually relies on behind the scenes quite a lot of uh, Hadoop libraries, including uh, the library that reads data from S3. And unfortunately, Hadoop, before the 2.8 release of Hadoop, uses a non-standard, non-AWS provided third-party library to read S3. And this third-party library doesn't understand instance profiles at all. Uh, now, the new Hadoop version after 2.8 is actually using the Amazon SDK. But uh, for class path reasons, I couldn't trivially use it with my Spark, uh, because Spark is deployed with uh, pre-packaged Hadoops together. So I, I actually download the Spark package that contains some Hadoop libraries. And these pre-packaged Hadoop libraries were 2.7. Um, there is Spark has a Hadoop-less version, which doesn't have any pre-packaged Hadoop. But uh, in that case, you are mandated. You have to supply Hadoop separately. And I just didn't have the time to try that. Another interesting observation here that uh, when you're developing Spark, you need to have a, a, a compile time dependency on the Spark APIs, um, which pulls in a, a couple of uh, dependencies, a couple of uh, indirect dependencies uh, through Maven. But this can be actually can result in actually different class paths that you will see when you are running um, Spark in a deployed version. Because of this various Hadoop version support, they use Maven profiles to build this, and, and it just 
sometimes ends up being a different uh, thing. It's not a problem in the vast majority of the cases, but it's good to be aware of that fact. So to wrap up, um, first of all, a couple of alternative solutions that we could do. Uh, Amazon Kinesis has an analytical side. Uh, I did a little bit of exploration on it. it it basically processes data in a SQL-like language in a streaming manner, but it's much, much, much more restrictive on the data structures. It has to be completely flat, and it kind of wanted to auto-discover the schema, and, and it resulted in a, in a schema that was very unuser friendly when, when it tried to parse uh, the CloudWatch events that were on that uh, stream. Um, so I, I, honestly, I don't think at this point it's... Um, um, it's good for this particular use case because of the data is too widely different there. You can use lambdas. In fact, there are uh, there is a product Cloud Custodian um, which we use in different projects. Now this uh, this is working in a way that. Um, you get the CloudWatch events, and instead of dropping them in Kinesis, you, Amazon invokes a, a Lambda uh, application um, and hands over the event data to it, and then you can do custom processing there. The only problem with this is that it cannot do uh, time window. It cannot do any sort of aggregations. You will have to deal with individual events yourself because Lambdas are stateless, but it's, uh, uh, it's actually otherwise a good solution. Um, and there are a couple of other stream processing technologies that are well established. Kafka Streams uh, is reasonable, but it requires Kafka, so it's probably less good a fit for this particular use case. And Apache Flink or Storm, they are uh, quite, uh, quite well established stream processing frameworks, and both of those could be used uh, uh, to do this. Uh, we haven't investigated them in more detail. So. Our ideas for improvements, uh, this solution, obviously this is a very embryonic state and we, we've deliberately just focused on uh, proving the concept itself, but you can uh, detect different types of attack vectors. You can set alerts on, okay, security groups changing, IAM permissions changing. What does this mean? That, is this something that we need to be worrying about and, and uh, set rules on these changes as well? You can also add a um, kind of a real-time impact analysis. If you maintain a dependency graph of your infrastructure and you Amazon CloudWatch generates an event for you of a change in some component, then you can explore what the impact is uh, of that change uh, overall. And obviously, we can do machine learning. Uh, so for now, we classifying what's usual and what's huge unusual uh, in like pre pre-written rules that we have to explore ourselves. But in theory, you could use machine learning to classify, to, you can teach your machine learning toolkit to identify this was a usual activity and this was an unusual and automatically fag whatever is unusual. Um, and you can do batch analytics as well. So CloudWatch gives you a lot of historical logs. Um, and you can do batch analysis on that. In some cases, you might want to see, okay, an instance is running for too long a time. That's not really a stream processing problem. That's much more suitable to do in a batch manner. And overall, um, structured streaming was quite good to work with. I, I did like it. Uh, the tabular data is easy to reason about and is not uh, it feels very restrictive in some cases, but, but it's actually not too bad. Uh, and also the Scala APIs are very expressive and, and very familiar, so it was easy to work with. The streaming nature is extremely well hidden, and, and very interestingly, the code is reusable to do batch analytics, so I could use the same code base or, or, or I could reuse much of the code base to do batch analysis on the same type of data structures. Class path and dependency management is something to be aware of, but again, it's not a problem that you generally run into. And, and Kinesis was, was fitting uh, structure streaming very, very well. I totally expect a connector, an officially supported connector to appear very, very soon because it's a, it's a very good fit. So thanks everybody for listening.